Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Maggie Howell, and I'm the Executive Director here at the Wolf Conservation Center. Um, before I begin, I just want to go through some quick tips. Uh, if you have any questions um, during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel, and we'll provide time for a Q&A session at the end of tonight's presentation. Also, a recorded version of this webinar will be available um, on the Wolf Conservation Center website, and that'll be in just a day or two. So let's get started. Um, today, we are joined by Dr. Joey Hinton, who has generously offered to discuss um, taxonomy, ecology, and management of coyotes in the Eastern United States. Joey earned his PhD at the University of Georgia in uh, 2014, and, his postdoctoral, and he's a postdoctoral researcher at SUNY ESF, assisting an ongoing study on the Adirondack moose population. While at the University of Georgia, Joey oversaw a large regional study on coyotes in southeastern United States and focused on the ecology and interactions of red wolves and coyotes uh, and ecological conditions facilitating hybridization between the two. His research has focused on the ecology, management, and conservation of wildlife populations with a focus on canid communities. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to turn the time over uh, to Joey. Hold on one sec. All right, here we go. OK, you can hear me? Yes. OK, excellent, awesome. All right, hello folks. Um, as Maggie mentioned, my name's Joey. Um, I'm a postdoc up at SUNY ESF, and uh, most of my research background has been on red wolf coyotes interactions and their ecology here in the eastern U.S. You know, mostly in the southeast. Um, so the talk today is just going to be like this large, comprehensive discussion about their taxonomy, the ecology, and management of those populations in this area. Um, I feel like I took a took a big bite here, um, so hopefully I can get most of it in in the 45 minutes or so that I have. Uh, but just a quick background about like the kind of uh, approach that I've taken to studying coyotes and what I think is kind of unique to what we've been doing at UGA uh, is 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 um, that started in the recovery area was that um, we didn't we came in looking at an issue from a conservation perspective with managing red wolves um, and seeing coyotes as a potential threat. And over time, relying on what was in the literature wasn't very useful. And I'll get into that here shortly um, in, in the talk, um, because uh, what we were seeing um, in the recovery area, the coyotes were behaving somewhat differently than what was, what was sort of being reported in, in previous studies. And uh, over time, we realized it was an issue of scale. Um, and, and a unique position at the recovery program was in with uh, managing coyotes over, you know, a broad area and trying to manipulate um, certain situations to ensure that the red wolves um, would maintain some genetic integrity, you know, via uh, mitigating hybridization threats. And so out of that, um, we wound up getting um, funded for other research throughout the Southeast to try to replicate that research in other states to get at sort of broader scale research uh, objectives, I guess, um, for agencies looking at uh, managing coyotes and, and learning more about their populations. Um, to do that, I mean, it essentially forced me to sort of take this big view of coyote um, evolution and ecology. So I, I tend to have this broad perspective of the species and learn to appreciate them. And so most of my research is, is goes from everything from just measuring uh, the, the body measurements of coyotes and, and looking at uh, geographic variation in that all the way up to what they're eating and, and how they're moving on the landscape and uh, how, how human, I guess, uh, exploitation influences their population dynamics. So I'll try to cover all that today. So hopefully you guys can follow along with that. Um, there are a lot of common misperceptions about coyotes. One of the one, um, one of the misperceptions is, you know, their geographic or their historic range. Um, I, I suppose the misperception came out, I think in the mid nineties with a book uh, called like the Eastern Coyote, it was from a guy named Parker, Parker 95. And basically you see a lot of replications of this map on the internet showing that the coyote was restricted to the central area of, of the Midwest, mostly to the prairies and that they experienced range expansion into the Western US and the California, Oregon, Washington, and up into Canada, and then eventually into the Eastern United States. 
but that's been corrected recently. Hody and Kay's uh, published a paper sort of uh, clarifying that that wasn't the case, that the Coyote's historic range was actually quite larger. And they were able to, to show um, based on historic specimens um, that, that, that have been recorded and kept in museums, uh, the, the range expansion of coyotes. Um, you can see their historic range is quite larger than what, what has been uh, published in the literature previously. Uh, and so with that, I'll just sort of jump into what we know. This is a paper that we published uh, recently following that uh, Hoden and Kay's paper. But basically what you want to look at here is this map that I have, and this shows the pre-Columbian uh, range expansion uh, of coyotes prior to the 20th century, or prior to Europe, or following European uh, colonization. Um, what you see in red here corresponds with Hoden and Kay's, the paper that you just saw before, um, showing their historic range prior to European settlement. Down here in um, uh, Southern Mexico and into Central America, you see these blue hatch marks. Um, that was the first range expansion that coyotes are assumed to have uh, experienced. Um, and that occurred in the 16th century when uh, the Spanish settlers or Spanish um, Europeans, you know, colonized Mexico um, and then converted a lot of that area into agriculture. Uh, coyotes in central Mexico would have then, you know, sort of uh, immigrated into Central America and colonized that area. Uh, the second range expansion occurred up into the Northwest areas or territories of Canada and then into Alaska. That occurred in the mid to late 19th century and uh, corresponded with uh, sort of extractive industries moving up into those regions and coyotes followed human settlement up that way. And the last and final um, expansion that they experienced would have been in the 20th century. It's the one we're all familiar with. It's the two fronts of movement into the Eastern United States, the first front coming into uh, the Northeast and then the second front coming into the Southeast until they completely occupy the Eastern US. Some of the explanations for this um, has been obviously the exportation, the expert, the expert, extirpation of wool, sorry guys, um, from areas. And that, that is true in the Eastern US where we extirpated wolves, mostly Eastern and red wolves from the Eastern areas. Um, that, that created a vacancy for these animals to move into, but it's not necessarily true for the other two range expansions. Uh, the Mexican gray wolf population didn't extend into Central America and Southern Mexico, so there was no wolf species down here. Their first expansion was a response to um, habitat changes, and up here in the northwest areas of uh, North America, the gray wolf populations were never extirpated either, and so coyotes were able to um, colonize in the presence of gray wolves. It just happens that red and eastern wolves, once they were extirpated, that uh, eastern that, that coyotes were able to move into the eastern U.S. But even in that situation, it was a delayed colonization. So we extirpated most of our wolf species in the eastern U.S. probably before the Civil War, and even then, um, coyotes weren't moving east until we uh, until we began changing the landscape quite a bit. Um, uh, following the 19th century, with the advent of like the invention of the car. Um, and converting agriculture, uh, wooded areas into agriculture. Um, we put in lots of road networks, like every 10 years there were major federal bills to build roads um, to connect rural areas to cities so that you could basically revitalize these rural communities and allow um, trade to happen. And so as they were sort of um, draining wetlands, converting that and forested areas into agriculture and then building roads to connect these communities, um, at that point, we start seeing movement of coyotes um, into the eastern U.S. It's not a surprise that you see this big movement of coyotes all throughout the eastern U.S. following the 1950s. Um, I think it was 1955 when Eisenhower passed that large highway federal uh, act, um, which pretty much established our interstate highways. And so when all that stuff was happening, um, it's not a coincidence that coyotes began popping up in these areas following that. Um, the other thing, too, which we'll cover here in a few slides, um, most of our, our common prey species that we hunt today were actually extirpated themselves. Uh, if you were alive in like 1910, 1915, um, there's a good chance you could, you could go throughout the remaining part of your life uh, not seeing a, a white-tailed deer. There were quite few, there were there, there few of them out there. Um, it's the same thing with wild turkeys, beavers, um, otters. A lot of these populations that we take for granted today were, um, were quite low. And so with the advent of wildlife management in the 1940s, um, as a profession, and you start seeing this, this effort by the government agencies to start restoring wildlife populations, um, they essentially reestablish um, 
important prey items on the landscape that, uh, that weren't available for coyotes prior to that. So what essentially primed the habitat to be invaded, you know, um, was the extirpation of wolves, but we also assisted coyote colonization by altering habitats and providing a new prey for them to come east. Um, so just taking a step back prior to that, I just want to show, um, I guess, what we had in the eastern U.S. as far as uh, canis species and their evolution in this, this region. During the early Pleistocene, coming out of the Pliocene, um, we would have had this small like coyote jackal-like species called Canis lepophagus um, on the landscape. And this is the original like Canis species that would have uh, initiated the lineage for for both wolves and coyotes in North America um, and probably throughout uh, the world. If these gray wolves eventually evolved in Eurasia. But anyway, um, after a while they went extinct and gave rise to uh, this other species called uh, Canis uh, riscolatrans. Um, and at that point, this was an animal that was large enough to be considered the first definite wolf um, in North America. And that's what you see up here. This is a, like an artwork to render like a, 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 what we think they look like. Uh, this larger wolf-like, or this larger canid looking species over here is what we call Barophagus. It's a family of extinct dog-like species that, um, or, or family that went extinct. And when they went extinct, you see this explosion in, in canis species in North America. Um, and so with the, uh, with the emergence of this species, we have a definite wolf in North America. And eventually that, that lineage becomes larger and it gives way to this uh, other species called canis armbrustery. And this is a very large canid that they think might have came over from Eurasia, but it's here in the eastern U.S. at this at this mid to late point during the Pleistocene, and it gives rise to Canis dyrus, which is the dire wolf. And so at some point we have um, this very large wolf species, you know, the dire wolf in the eastern U.S. And because it's large enough uh, to focus its feeding on large ungulate species or megafauna, it, it allowed a, a niche for two smaller um, canis species to sort of evolve and, and coexist with it. Uh, that, the, the smaller one is Canis latrans. And so we had Canis latrans in the eastern United States during the late, you know, during the mid Pleistocene. And it allowed the emergence of a, it's sort of an intermediate size wolf species, which we refer to as Canis rufus, to sort of emerge in the eastern US at that time. Um, but by the late Pleistocene, um, the only species that we see uh, in our fossil record, I guess, would be Canis rufus. Uh, and so with the extinction of megafauna, like a lot of the large prey in, in North America, sort of set up the demise of uh, the, the dire wolf. And at the same time, uh, Canis lupus, your gray wolf, sort of emigrated in from um, Eurasia and began colonizing North America. So that sort of hastened the extinction of the Canis, or of uh, the, the dire wolves. Um, and at that point, with the dire wolf dying off um, and coyotes then competing with this smaller wolf species in eastern North America, um, at some point, uh, red wolves have simply just pushed coyotes out of uh, eastern North America into the, their sort of historic range that we know of now in, 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 um, in the uh, mid and western U.S. And at that point, it took, um, it became the predominant canid species uh, in the eastern U.S. Um, and so that's, that's where we were when Europeans settled. So that occurred about 15,000 years ago. As I mentioned before, we know coyotes existed in the Eastern US because we have fossil records of them here. This is from NOAC's work that was published about 20 years ago. Um, these, uh, these dots represent um, um, remains or fossils of, of uh, coyote species or coyote specimens that were found here. Um, at some point, um, there's an absence after that, after like 15,000 years. We don't see coyotes showing up in the fossil record anymore. Uh, and so what you see in the hatch here, these cross hatches, are, is the coyote uh, historic range at the time Europeans settled. What's in gray here is assumed to be the gray wolf's uh, historic range. And then what's in white here would have been uh, the red wolf's historic range. And so you can see at that time period, you know, in the Pleistocene, uh, when you had this changeover in the Canadian community, when dire wolf goes extinct, uh, gray wolves invade um, at the same time, um, Red wolves sort of emerge, become the predominant canid. Um, coyotes then sort of retreat and contract their range um, to the Midwest and Western U.S. And they learn to coexist with this new gray wolf um, species that, that just recently invaded. But what's interesting is that some research has showed that they found a way to coexist with them 
by becoming smaller. So if you go to the bottom right hand side of this, this graph here, you see the circumference of their femurs, and this is sort of correlated with body size. Coyotes during this time, you know, in the mid Pleistocene, were uh, larger than they are today. They were probably about the 40, 45 pound mark. And over time, you see this shift in their body size. They become smaller. And then around, I guess, 10,000 years ago, um, they start resembling what we see as far as size in our modern coyotes. And they don't really change all that much. And this area right here where you see that shift is basically um, that time period when they retreated out of the Eastern US and began coexisting with gray wolves. And so, this, so I suspect what happened was that they couldn't become small enough to coexist with red wolves in the Eastern US. Competition got pretty tight and uh, these larger canids were able to push coyotes out and uh, reclaim, basically claim the East for themselves. But there was a large enough size discrepancy between uh, gray wolves and coyotes. Um, and there was enough, uh, I guess, diversity of ungulate species in the Midwest and the Western parts of the US that they could partition resources, that coyotes could shift down to uh, smaller prey sources and over time sort of become smaller themselves and uh, make things work out where they could coexist with gray wolves, but not, not in the Eastern US. And so from that time until recently, they were absent. But as you saw before, we do have them now and sort of just go through um, what we know about them. So coyotes are pretty much um, ubiquitous across North America and into Mexico. And they, uh, they have a lot of geographic variation. And so this is some photos of some coyotes that I took here in the Eastern US and out in California. And we wrote a paper up looking at their morphometrics and their genetics to see how that variation um, or how they're, how they're, how they're you know, their morphometrics, their phenotype, and their genetics varied on the landscape. And so um, what we found was that, you know, um, there is a size gradient. So basically your Western coyotes, like you see in this gray bar here, are your smaller coyotes. And then your larger coyotes are in the Northeast and that your uh, Southeastern coyotes are pretty much intermediate to them. So we have three populations that are sort of distinct in size. And we see that with males and females. The one interesting thing is, is when you look at the maximum weight, that is the biggest animals that we catch um, in our studies and look at that, that like the, how big these animals get as far as their max weight. Um, Southeastern coyotes aren't any different than your, your, your Western coyotes. So your biggest coyotes in like Oklahoma, West Texas, Montana, Utah are probably gonna be very similar in size to our biggest coyotes in say Alabama, Tennessee, or Georgia. That's not the case in the Northeast. In the Northeast, your bigger animals are much bigger than the bigger animals, you know, in other areas, if that makes sense. And a lot of this is tied to hybridization with wolves. So there's those very large animals up in the Northeast tend to have greater wolf ancestry in them. And these animals in the Southeast. Um, but what was interesting about um, the morphometrics or the, the morphology of these species or these populations, as you say, is that we found we threw all these um, body measurements into sort of these multivariant analyses that we do. Um, we, we got three important, um, what we call principal components, um, which are unique sort of um, variables where they, they sort of um, look at all the redundant variables. And, and anyway, the <laughs> point being is, is it's, it's, it's an approach that we use in, in, um, in morphometrics to, to um, reduce the, uh, the number of variables we have to get at the, the, the key variable or the key uh, body measurements that are driving variation that we see. And um, the three that came out were body size, which is PC1. Uh, PC2 is appendage lengths, which is basically uh, how, how long their ears are and how long their tails are. It would correlate with limb length, like in, in the case of, uh, it could be paw length, stuff like that, paw size. And then the final one was uh, head dimensions. So it was basically skull morphology. And the, the importance here is that basically um, when animals get larger, uh, other things get bigger with them um, in, in terms of uh, like body mass. So a heavier animal would probably have a, would be taller, would be longer. Um, so a lot of things are correlated with body mass. And so it's important to find body measurements that, um, that may vary on the landscape that are independent to weight bearing. And that's what we see here with these other two PCs that came out. Uh, skull morphology usually correlates well with diet. So some animals could be large, but they may have um, a different diet than um, smaller animals. So you would see a different shape or um, uh, measurements come out with that, the head dimensions. Same thing with the appendages. And so with PC1 here, you're looking at the averages of these, these values. 
And we see the same trend with body size. Animals in the West are smaller than the ones in the Southeast, and the Southeast are intermediate to what we see in the Northeast and the South and out West. Um, and with PC2, with uh, measurements for ears and tails, that's not the case. We see that coyotes in the Southeast tend to have smaller ears and smaller tails than those out West and up in the Northeast, but the populations out West and up in the Northeast have similar size ears and, and, and tails. Um, as far as skull morphology goes, um, we didn't see a big difference in um, those dimensions, um, which to me was kind of important. It shows that coyotes have a pretty, um, I guess, conservative diet in terms of uh, regional differences. Um, you would expect that if coyotes were uh, better deer predators in the southeast, say, than compared to the west, um, you, you would expect maybe larger head, like a, a bigger head in relation to the body size or something like that. Uh, but that's not the case. So for me, as somebody who, who studies their diet and is concerned about differences across regions, this kind of confirms that um, we shouldn't expect coyotes to do a whole lot of, of difference from one area to the next as far as what they're eating. They're largely going to focus on small mammals, uh, smaller ungulate species, and offspring of those ungulate species, um, and, and rely on, 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 um, on, on, some, uh, on some fruit and vegetables or whatever. So with regards to their genetics, as you can see here in the middle here, Washington, California, Indiana, or Idaho and Arizona, whatnot, this is their historic range out west. Um, down here we have southeast, we have specimens from Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and then from the northeast you can see Pennsylvania, Jersey, um, Maine, New Brunswick, Ontario. Um, uh, and what you're looking at is, is their genetic um, structuring uh, or, or struct an output from structure, which looks at the uniqueness of the populations as far as their genetics go. And what we, we find is that um, we have three distinct populations. Um, in this case, uh, when you use two populations, you see an Eastern population and a Western population. But when you consider three populations, you get, uh, you get, you get a, a unique Southeastern population too. Um, if you go to four or five, you don't find any unique structure at that end. Um, so this, this confirms that we do have three distinct uh, regional population of coyotes. And so the morphometrics and the genetics sort of agree on this. And that's where we can go forward with this, this, this you know, with, with understanding the populations here in the eastern U.S. So it conforms, or, it, or at least not conforms, but it, it corroborates what um, folks were saying 30, 40 years ago about how coyotes came into the U.S. They suggest that there was two primary fronts, one coming up through the Great Lakes into the Northeast and another one down through the, through the, the coastal areas of the Southeast and that moved up into the uh, Mid-Atlantic area. Um, and then within that Northeastern um, range expansion, there was two distinct uh, like sub routes, uh, one north of the Great Lakes that wound up hybridizing with Eastern wolves and moving um, an intergress population into New England uh, population moved through the, the you know these uh, midwestern states of the U.S. south of the Great Lakes into the Northeast. They would have been your typical western coyotes that didn't have um, any wolf introgression into that in, in their genome. And so when these two fronts emerged here in the in the Northeast, they intermingled, and that population that went north of the Great Lakes brought in those eastern wolf genetics with them. And so that's why you have this mixture of um, of, uh, of a coyote popular with, with a mixture of re uh, eastern wolf and coyote ancestry in them. So up here in the New England area, you don't actually have hybrids. You don't have a wolf population breeding with coyotes and creating like koi wolves, like what people commonly call them. What you have is this, this historic introgression out here in the Great Lakes that occurred. And as those populations moved into New England, um, they, they ceased hybridizing, but they maintain that ancestry in their genome. Um, and it just, it's there now. And it, it just sort of documents that there was, ancient, not ancient, but previous hybridization. We had a similar event in the Southeast. Um, remnant wolf populations in East Texas and Louisiana, um, or Western Louisiana down here, um, the coyotes as they began expanding to the Southeast, came in contact with those populations and hybridized with red wolves. And so they moved east away from those populations. Um, the introgression obviously decreased over time, but it's still there. So if you were to sample coyotes in the southeast, you'll find some, some red wolf ancestry in them, but not as much 
as you would find in the Northeast because that red wolf population has been removed from the wild and it's not there anymore, even though we do pick up some ancestry and canids in this area. Um, I have a few slides discussing that here shortly. Uh, so, so the other aspect is dog coyote hybridization. Um, usually we have this, this unique phenotype here in the east uh, of, a, of a black coyote that people associate with coyote dog hybridization. Um, and that is, that is partially true. Um, that, that black, that, that melanism is, is usually triggered by this uh, K locus um, allele that's, it, it, that's in, this, in, in their genome, I guess, in their genetics now. And, and basically when a, a coyote has that, it, it triggers this sort of color black, this unique melanism in there that, that can vary quite a bit. You get like jet black animals, like you see this one on the right here, or you get this, uh, you get this mixture, I think it's called a gutu or a duda. Um, you get this sort of black, brown, white uh, coloration. It gives them like a, a, a similar, I guess, uh, uh, coat colors as a German shepherd or, or a Dutch shepherd. It looks quite different from what you see with your typical gray phase. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that melanism is traced back to uh, some, some dog hybridization. But what we see in the wild now is we don't, we don't encounter any dog hybridization. We don't find any kind of odd looking um, coyotes that sort of would morphometrically look like a koi dog. When you get your hands on these animals that are black or strawberry blonde that indicate that they have some dog alleles in them, uh, morphometrically, they're the same as your typical gray face coyote. Um, same head measurements, same, same height, same weight. Um, there's nothing special about them in that, in, in, in that case. Um, but they do show some dog haplotypes in them. And so one of these studies done quite a, a while ago shows that um, this widespread dog haplotype in uh, the, the populations here in the Southeast might have, been, uh, might have been a result of a single hybridization event that happened probably uh, prior to coyote colonization. Um, probably in the early 1900s as a result of people moving dog or moving coyotes and um, into the, uh, the Southeast. The assumption is, is that once coyotes got here, um, they, they didn't have an established population. So the only thing they could breed with would be wild dogs or feral dogs. And in that case, they would create these koi dogs. And then eventually the coyote population colonized the area and they back crossed into this, this new population. And that's how they got these dog genetics. But as I mentioned, um, we don't see dog hybridization occur in the wild. I don't know of any documented case of any coyotes consorting with, uh, with, with, with feral dogs. Um, there's usually no complaints um, with uh, dogs being bred by coyotes. You think people would call in and, and report that stuff. Um, so we just, there's no evidence that this is occurring. Uh, and so the, only, the only evidence that I've seen that uh, coyotes breed with dogs has been in captive settings. And this is a classic paper from 1971. This researcher himself had bred coyotes with domestic dogs. You can see him here with various uh, koi dogs that he, he created by, you know, breeding beagles or, you know, um, border collie mutts with, um, with some coyotes that he had caught. And what's interesting is that he notes that they escaped and that at some point um, he had to, to pretty much euthanize them to Keep, uh, to have some goodwill with his with his neighborhood because he had issues with with these critters getting out and so this is what I suspect that happened um, based on my experience uh, working with these things in the wild um, that yeah people probably caught these animals when they first got here or they imported them um, and in the event that they um, they had them there on their properties they probably bred them with their dogs and maybe back crossed them again and at some point the ones that were very coyote like probably escaped and then back crossed into the wild population as it began to, to um, um, colonize the area. So I, I don't suspect that the, the, the dog haplotypes that we see um, in coyotes out there in the Eastern US results from wild breeding. I think it, it likely occurred through uh, captive uh, breeding with, with escapees. So now finally getting into the management component, I guess, of the talk. Um, with them now established throughout the eastern U.S., they sort of exist on this sort of rural to urban gradients and how we manage their populations differ on this gradient. Most of my talk is going to focus here on out on these rural communities um, that have them um, because that's where most of my research occurs. In those areas, usually there's issues with coyote depredation on livestock and there's also issues with their predation on, on wild game species or threatened and endangered species. And in these situations, usually uh, our control of these um, 
uh, of these issues or how we, we manage for them is, is through lethal control. Uh, just because it's cheaper and it seems to be more effective short term wise. Um, but over time, we're seeing that non lethal approaches are, are better. And um, there's um, increasing research suggesting that we should incorporate more of this stuff into uh, our approach to managing coyote populations. And uh, again, uh, we'll get into that here shortly with the wolf stuff. But um, as they sort of progress into urban environments, uh, you don't have livestock or, or these sort of um, endangered wildlife populations or, or anything like that that would commonly be an issue in the rural areas. Instead, you have issues with uh, depredation on pets and you have issues where you have some coyote attacks on people. Most recently, yeah, like here in Jersey, you had a, a recent attack on somebody at Rutgers. Um, every now and then you'll hear about a child getting bit or something like that. And so those are, those are issues unique to urban areas that you don't often see in rural areas. Um, and instead of involving your, your, um, your resource agencies or your agricultural agencies, um, a lot of times um, <laughs> people turn to their local municipalities um, or their homeowners associations who then reach out to say wildlife services or your resource agencies like here in New Jersey, be New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, or if you were in North Carolina, it'd be North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, stuff like that. And in those situations, they may advise the landowner to go ahead and contact a private trapper to do something. Um, but a lot of times, you know, when people call in and have these issues, uh, they don't want to kill the coyotes. They just want to remove them from the area, but you can't relocate coyotes like that. And so lethal methods, methods become an, an issue in urban areas and they're usually, you know, like I said, uh, unpopular. And so as we, you know, as we start dealing with this issue, resource agencies are, are concerned about this and they are, are, you know, ongoing research to figure out how to, um, manage coyotes in urban areas non-lethally through like, you know, establishing flandry um, posts or hazing and, and stuff like that. And so that's a, it's a research area that's kind of up and coming. It's an area that I don't do much research in, so you're not going to hear much of it here on out. Um, but um, it is there. It's something that we're looking at. So um, regarding management circumstances, like I said, in rural areas, um, if it's not dealing with livestock, if it's dealing with like issues with wild turkeys or deer or even like uh, um, nesting areas for sea turtles or shorebirds, a lot of your management is going to be lethal. Um, usually in the case of uh, livestock, I think there's, um, they, they tend to focus on non-lethal uh, um, approaches first. And when that doesn't resolve an issue, they go ahead and give landowners an opportunity to use lethal control. But regardless, here are some of the circumstances that we would manage coyotes under. Um, in this case, we may want to use, uh, you know, we may want to reduce their densities to sort of help propagate uh, some, reintrodu some reintroduced populations that, that are vulnerable. In this case, an example would be like the red wolf. We know that coyotes can hybridize with wolves and that hybridization threatens the, uh, the integrity of the red wolf's genome. Um, and so in that case, we have deployed both lethal and non-lethal approaches to managing coyotes in North Carolina. Another one is, is when you um, have prey populations that you want to sort of uh, meet a, a sort of objective or a management goal. Um, and if coyote predation is suppressing their numbers and not allowing you to reach those objectives, you may go in there and remove coyotes to sort of help those populations rebound to a certain um, level that you, you feel meets management goals. Uh, the other issue is, is if they focus on sensitive prey populations, like I mentioned before, uh, along coastal areas where we're trying to recover uh, and conserve uh, sea turtles or, uh, or certain shorebirds that are endangered, their nesting areas are um, sensitive to predation. And so when coyotes come in and, and predate on their nest, it's an issue. In that case, you may want to manage them around those areas. And then finally, um, if there's specific areas that you're managing um, uh, for, for a particular species uh, and predation is, has a negative effect on it, you, you may want to go ahead and and use some lethal control to, to remove that pressure on those, those species that you're concerned about. And that's kind of redundant with the, the other three uh, circumstances that I just mentioned. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the white-tailed deer populations is uh, the primary, I guess, issue that sort of triggers concerns about coyote presence in the Eastern US. Uh, this is the most um, popular game species uh, it's a big revenue generator for our resource agencies. Um, and so coyote predation on, on white-tailed deer can, can dampen their populations in some areas. And, and then that may affect hunter recruitment. Uh, it may affect um, 
local economies that re rely on, on hunting um, for, for, a very, uh, to, for, for revenue and whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the primary trigger for our concern about coyotes. If coyotes didn't eat deer, if they just subsisted on rabbits and small mammals, we wouldn't be concerned about them. We probably wouldn't have be having this webinar right now. So looking at um, the deer population in the US um, from about 1700 to today, uh, we can see deer numbers were quite high uh, prior to the Civil War. There was a decline here, but the main issue with deer numbers came after the Civil War. Overexploitation basically extirpated their populations by 1900. Although they weren't extinct, uh, most areas uh, white-tailed deer were absent from. Um, and then once, uh, once in, you know, the turn of the century came along and we began establishing important conservation and wildlife management laws, um, there was an effort to begin um, recovering game populations. So starting in the 1940s, we began translocating deer from like the Great Lakes region, uh, parts of Texas into parts of the southeastern U.S. to recover their numbers. Um, uh, I don't think in areas of the northeast there was many reintroductions. They were just uh, um, just small populations. But either way, these uh, these populations were protected. There was no deer hunting at that time, um, and these efforts sort of uh, they, they they wind up recovering deer. And you see this big explosion in deer numbers throughout the U.S from 1950 to, to today. And so these efforts uh, have basically reestablished deer throughout the Eastern US and most of North America. And uh, they're now a common game species. Um, and so they're here. Um, and this is uh, basically, this is what uh, corresponds when coyotes began colonizing the Eastern US. And so uh, they, they are um, feeding on deer and it is the primary issue that we have uh, with their management. So just showing here uh, the Eastern US, the states, um, you can see these red lines. These indicate uh, growth of coyote populations from 1970 until about 2014. And most states you see a J-share curve that indicates like exponential growth. So we know um, coyotes began rebound, not rebounding, but began um, sort of exponentially growing in, in most areas after 1970 and sort of saturated by the 2000s. And so if we take a quick look um, at deer numbers and coyote numbers in South Carolina, that's where you see this red block here, looking at this J-shaped curve. What you see with deer numbers is that at the, 19, you know, at the beginning of the 1970s, you start to see this recovery of white-tailed deer populations in South Carolina. And then around 2000, you begin to see this, this decline in their numbers in that state. Um, and that sort of corresponds with the coyote population in this purple line you see. Uh, the number of coyotes that were harvested um, that correlates with their population size. So you start seeing this, this big explosion in coyote numbers. And what they're concerned about in South Carolina, like they would be in other states are seeing a similar trend, is that as you see coyote numbers increase, you start to see this decline in, in deer numbers. Um, there's been a, a, a big debate about this in the US, uh, among you know, wildlife biologists as to whether or not this should trigger some concern. Um, there's some folks who don't think it should because deer numbers aren't threatened at a big scale. They're here. Um, they're quite abundant in most areas, but at smaller spatial scales, there is an issue. Um, and so that's where management gets concerned because um, it creates problems for them in some areas that they may be managing for specific things. Um, so depending on who you talk to, they may not consider coyotes a threat to deer. Others, not so much. Um, I tend to fall on the side of where it, they, you, know, you don't have to worry much about coyotes. They're not having a big impact, but like I said, others may, may think they are. Um, most of what we know about coyotes and their, their predation on ungulates um, comes from the Midwest and out, or, or out West, mostly because, like I said, we didn't have many predators in the U Eastern US. We covered deer numbers in the last 50 years. And so most of your Eastern biologists that first encountered coyotes 30 years ago, trying to understand them, would have borrowed um, our, our um, interpretations of what we see out West and applied it to the Eastern system. And so what we assume occurs out West in most cases is that coyotes scavenge uh, ungulate species, uh, carcasses, that's how they get deer in their diet. Um, usually in those areas, you have winter mortality and some die off of individuals and coyotes exploit those carcasses. Um, and now that we have gray wolves in Yellowstone, um, in this case, coyotes are exploiting carcasses that are, are created in a landscape from uh, wolf kills. And so, you know, early studies where scientists had seen that coyotes were 
consuming deer here in the eastern U.S., they assumed it was a result of scavenging um, because that's what they, they assumed was having, happening out west. But that, that's not really the case. Um, what you see throughout North America, coyotes have a, a pretty unique, uh, I should say unique, but they, they do serve as a predator of many ungulate species. Um, even though they don't hunt adult bison, there's been incidences where they have taken their calves. Not a lot, but you can just see the boldness of coyotes when there's an opportunity to take advantage of it. They've been known in some areas to, to, uh, to, to affect pronghorn uh, populations in some areas of uh, out west where uh, jackrabbits have been extirpated, um, coyotes have shifted to feeding on pronghorn fawns and that's negatively affected like pronghorn numbers. Here is a, is a coyote attacking a, a mule deer. I think that one failed, uh, it was reported in a paper. But down here, these are photos of coyotes um, preying on adult deer and fawns, um, whitetails here in the eastern US. So they do, uh, we have documented them um, preying on, on larger ungulate species. They're just not obligate predators like wolves are because they're smaller body size. Um, that that, that, that uh, predation varies quite a bit on the landscape. And so that's the issue that we have when you're looking at how these, these, these populations sort of um, conflict with uh, harvest management of, of deer. Um, because coyotes aren't consistently preying on them at like a high, <clears throat> high rate throughout their, their, uh, their range, um, we don't know how that variation uh, occurs on the landscape. Um, and so the responses tend to vary quite a bit to coyote predation. Um, one is, is at the regional level, and that's usually, um, that's usually uh, where your resource agencies uh, are trying to manage um, populations across the state. Uh, and that, that, that's usually done at the policy level. So they may set regulations for, um, for coyote take. Um, in most states, coyotes can be hunted 24 seven. Um, a lot of the uh, issues with uh, advocacy groups and resource agencies has been the recent uh, promotion of uh, nighttime hunting of coyotes. And so, you know, if you go back 20 years ago, you probably would have just opportunistically taken coyotes while you were out deer hunting or turkey hunting. In this case, um, with nighttime hunting, it's created, uh, I guess, a new class of hunters that are, that are specifically predator hunters. So they'll, they'll equip up and go out at night and, and specifically look to hunt for coyotes. Um, and that's been a contentious issue. Um, but that's, that's, that's a situation where your resource agencies would, uh, would change policies and, and whatnot to sort of uh, deal with coyote problems. Um, at the local scale, uh, your resource agencies, because in many cases they don't own a lot of land, um, your, your local scale management is going to be your typical, your, typically your landowners. And they'll work with um, some groups like the Quality Deer Management Association, and then they have the opportunity to either hire trappers to come in and trap their properties, or if they want to do some non-lethal approach, they can modify habitat. They can, they can manage for um, fawn habitat. So if they want to reduce coyote predation on fawns, they could uh, create cover that would um, allow fawns to uh, seek refuge on their property and, and have lower coyote predation. Uh, as you guys are probably aware already, large scale control has historically been poor. Um, coyotes have always been, uh, I guess, uh, heavily exploited by humans and targeted by our resource agencies as far as reducing their numbers. And uh, we haven't effectively found a way to do that. Um, but small scale controls have um, yielded sort of um, contrary outcomes. So, so in some areas where we have lethally control for coyotes, remove them from properties, you can see where um, fawn recruitment increases. And so some of those management objectives are achieved. Other areas where you remove coyotes, you see no change um, and say fawn recruitment, um, there's still high predation. And so it's, it's hit or miss. Um, but at the end of the day, um, it's, it's still, you know, the opportunity to control is still there. So when, when many of these uh, statewide programs um, are established, they, to me, in my opinion, they tend to be vague. And one of the reasons is because it's so difficult to set objectives and achieve goals when managing coyote populations that it's probably best not to do that. And so a lot of these programs are just there to establish some type of awareness, allowing people to know what their legal tools are to sort of manage for coyote populations. And that's where I think a lot of state agencies are right now with, with these populations. Um, and, that's, um, and that's a result of, I think, a, a lack of 
knowledge as to um, what their populations are actually doing on the landscape. So we have a really good um, history of managing populations. If we want to, you know, we know what to do as far as deer, comp, you know, as far as deer, turkeys, um, otters, stuff like that that I mentioned before that we recovered. Manage these species. We we do a good job of of um, uh, manipulating the populations to get to certain objectives. Um, and a lot of that's because we know populations are more than just a head count. They're usually, uh, there's usually ecological evolutionary processes there that are resulting in these persistence of these species um, that's tied to like survival, reproduction, emigration. Um, the issue here is that uh, the coyote populations tend to be operating probably at a scale that we don't understand. Um, so we don't know where to apply these management tools. Uh, they likely have this better population structure um, on the landscape where you have areas where coyote populations are doing really well. Um, they have more, uh, their birth rates are greater than their death rates, which we call like a source population. And there's other areas where um, their populations probably struggle um, and don't do so well. Those areas we call sinks, where you would have more deaths than you have births, um, but they still sustain, they're sustained through emigration from these source populations. Um, and so uh, our, our guess, at least mine is, is that coyotes are, are largely limited by space and mates. And so what we see is that you have the surplus of coyotes on the landscapes that we call transients that have these extensive movements. They bounce around um, and they seem to be nomadic individuals that aren't paired up with another animal, so they're not breeding. And then as you see with these, these colored areas, these are home ranges of uh, coyotes that are paired up with another animal. Um, they're breeders and they're essentially tied down to this area that they protect their territory and they're responsible for, uh, they're, they're essentially, they're the, uh, they're, they're the reproducing portion of the population. And these transient animals just sort of move around the landscape, bounce around, and eventually uh, a breeder will die and this transient population um, tends to, uh, individuals from that population tend to move in and uh, assume the new resident role. And so from my perspective, at least working in North Carolina with wolves, what we were seeing was that during the hunting season, you'd have a number of people come out and they would um, harvest a lot of our canids on the landscape and they would create a lot of turnover. Um, and then you would see these transients collapse in those areas that ex experience high mortality and they would essentially pair up, form new breeding pairs and start breeding again. So you saw this sort of um, restructuring of the population following hunting season and then they would just sort of move forward and start reproducing, drop pups. And then the following year, you had a healthy population of coyotes that could withstand the uh, hunting pressure. And so that's what we were seeing and that's what we were getting interesting in. Um, and so um, just, to, just to switch up here. So the problem with, with that and capturing this movement, so a lot of our study areas are small and it's difficult to capture these, these big movements. We have an issue of scale. And so we see that different patterns emerge at different scales. Um, and so that may create different you know, relationships, uh, statistical relationships in, return, in regards of um, uh, change uh, with, uh, with uh, population change and whatnot. Um, so with scale, I'm talking about spatial extent, not level of organization. So in this case, um, a population, uh, uh, you know, at this, at this area here at fine scale, we're talking about uh, small study areas going to large study areas. So this may be like 100 square kilometers uh, compared to a, a large area that's maybe 1,000 square kilometers. Um, in this case here, going up in grain, you may be looking at a couple individuals, uh, looking at behavioral things like, um, you know, diet or whatnot. And then up here, you're looking at broad scale population movements, um, maybe, you know, how residents are, are, are establishing territories across a broad area. And so that spatial extent defines our population size. Um, so small study areas are usually, you know, incorporating a small amount of coyotes in their studies and they're not really looking at the entire population. And that could be problematic with extrapolating out. Um, and so when you look at your studies, you kind of want to find this, I guess this Goldilocks um, area where you, you kind of have the right extent and the right grain. So if you're looking at, a, you're trying to establish a study looking at how uh, say white-tailed deer are responding to coyote um, presence um, and predation, that might be a fine scale study where you look at a small area and you set up camera traps and you look at how deer uh, are, are, are foraging and whether or not they have their head up or down and how they're responding to uh, the movement of coyotes around them. 
that would be a fine scale study. But if you're looking at how um, deer numbers are, are um, negatively affected by coyote predation, that would be up here somewhere. You would look at a broad scale, maybe across several counties and look at, at, at deer density and relate that to coyote density. So the data is more coarse. Um, in that case, up here, you're not capturing the more fine scale behavioral stuff. And down here, you're, you're missing the more coarse scale um, aspects of the population processes. And so the hard part is, is trying to find that middle ground that your studies can, can do both. Um, because that's, if he's man, that's important for management too, because management uh, sort of uh, exists at this gradient itself. Um, and so that's where we were here in the recovery area. We found sort of a happy medium there, I thought, as, as a PhD student when I was out there working. As I mentioned before, when I look at coyote studies in the literature um, to get familiar with what other folks were doing, most of the studies areas were like 150 to 300 square kilometers. Um, Eastern North Carolina and the Alvaro Peninsula where we had red wolves in the recovery area, that, that area was about 6,500 square kilometers. It's like three fourths the size of Yellowstone National Park. So that study area would essentially accomplish like 20 like average coyote size study areas from other, other areas. And so here you have like four boxes in different colors. These would represent your average coyote, like the size of your average size of a coyote study area. And if we were looking at diet in the recovery area, and these would be four independent studies here around Pungo Lake, um, where you have a lot of like tundra swans um, settle in during the, during the winter when they're migrating down, uh, you would find a lot of uh, bird in, in a coyote diet there, or wolf diet. And you would assume that they play an important role uh, for, you know, for, 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 for food basically for these animals. If you go north up here in this warehouse a lot, further north, there's no water there. You don't have tundra swans there. What you would see with these coyotes or these wolves up in this area, they would be mostly consuming deer, rabbits, and small mammals. But over here in this purple box, there's some hog barns over here. Um, so the animals that, or that exist over here, they're consuming some domestic pigs uh, that are carcasses that are often put in these hog pits um, when they're discarded. And so you start to see this reliance on, um, uh, I guess, domestic food, uh, supplemental food or whatever. And then there's a, there's a, there's a Dare County um, uh, landfill out here where this yellow box is. So the animals out here tend to have some anthropogenic food sources uh, in their diet. And so looking at these four different areas, if there were four independent studies, you have these contrary, like uh, contradicting um, um, uh, uh, findings about their diet. But that's not a problem when you look at the entire population across the peninsula. And that's what happened with me by accident, by working with the recovery program um, I'm with my PhD. Uh, and so when we were seeing different things out there, I realized it was because uh, we were studying an actual large coyote population. And most of the animals that we caught and captured out there stayed within the recovery area, um, except for a few. But um, basically, you know, the management out there was to look at breeding pairs across the landscape and manage them. And they did a bunch of different things that I had the opportunity to work with them with. Um, one of the areas was the, how they managed for coyotes. And like I said before, they did a mixture of lethal and non-lethal control. That non-lethal aspect was sterilizing coyotes out there and putting them back out and studying them. And that came through with the you know, annual monitoring. So we go out and trap them, put radio collars on them and then cut them loose and then monitor for, for uh, reproduction, at least for the wolves. When we were doing that, we would routinely pick up coyotes or hybrids. Um, instead of um, letting them back out as reproductively active individuals, we would sterilize them. And so we, then we would put them back out with the intent that if they had paired up with the wolf, it would prevent hybridization um, and, and limit um, introgression into the population. And what we found out was that uh, these individuals maintained um, strong pair bonding with other coyotes. And so they were able to maintain territories when they weren't territorial and they were moving about, when a vacancy opened up, they would move in and acquire that territory, just like another normal non-sterilized coyote would. And the important thing here was as space holders, they could displace coyotes that weren't sterilized. Um, we had a lot of situations where coyotes were uh, establishing territories around wolves. Um, and in this case, if they were breeding, uh, they would generate pups um, and those pups you would become juveniles and then they might interact with other wolf other wolves in that area, other wolf juvenile, juvenile wolves, and they could hybridize in that situation, but by sterilizing them, um, they didn't do that and they prevented other animals from getting into those areas. Um, and just to give you a quick synopsis of like what was, how this, this technique worked, 
This is a red wolf pack. Um, these three animals were, um, were poached. And so that created a vacancy on the landscape. Um, we knew that uh, we had to go back in there and trap for the wolves and we were gonna have some coyote encroachment. These, these, this, these uh, gold dots down here represent a wolf that moved in, a female. Um, so we were lucky that this female wolf moved in um, and we were able to monitor her. But we had these other coyotes collapse in and in territory and we wound up sterilizing those animals. So this is a coyote pack up here. This green and this other one is purple one. So you have three breeders move in, which were six coyotes that wound up being sterilized. These brown dots were a coyote that she paired up with. Um, and so essentially we removed three wolves and we had six, seven coyotes collapse in on that area and occupy that space. Um, over time, we have to figure out how to remove those animals. And then you have other animals around. These are GPS locations for other you know, resident animals nearby. Uh, we had animals in here. There's no dots because they're VHF. I just don't have that data on me right now. So the, 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 the issue we had to do was remove this animal, which we wound up doing and freeing him up, freeing her up to have uh, somebody from nearby moving with her. Luckily, this wolf here was available. He did just that. And we were able to rec recoup that area um, for the wolves. And, uh, and that's usually how the sterilization works. Um, sometimes the wolf is not the first one to move in. It's usually a coyote. And sterilization prevented her from having hybrid pups. So after a year, we removed her. He paired up with her. And for three years, they were successful at raising pups um, and creating um, new wolves in the landscape. And so what we see is that in these small boxes, like at the like these smaller scales, you're trying to um, implement management on the population at these local levels with the idea that those effects would ripple out into surrounding areas. So by having this breeding wolf pair here, those pups would uh, eventually disperse out down here where they may disperse back east and reinforce the, the packs out there that lost breeders. And so that became like my main focus out there was as animals died and seeing what was on the landscape, how these populations are, how these, how these transient individuals collapsed in on those vacancies. So coyote movements became a really important part of my research and trying to figure out what they were doing out there. Um, oh, so anyway, <laughs> just, just to mention, um, the results of that adaptive management plan was pretty good. Sterilizing coyotes worked. We were able to increase coy uh, wolf numbers. Introgression was low. Um, and hybridization mostly resulted from wolves getting shot and not having enough wolves on the landscape to recover that lost area. Coyotes move in, the sole surviving wolves would pair up with them and, and hybridize. That was when it happened. So wolves didn't hybridize with coyotes because they wanted to, they hybridized because at times they had to. Um, but with the coyote management, um, that was the positive of, of, the, the, uh, of the, the wolf side, but there was also a positive for the coyote side, because we were learning how to manage coyotes broadly across the landscape there. Something that's not been, that hasn't been successful elsewhere. So all these red dots represent um, captures of coyotes in the recovery area from 99 to 2013. And you can see that we had broad access to properties and we did a good job of catching lots of coyotes out there. And what we found out was that from 99 to about 2013, we captured about 400 coyotes. Um, most of them were caught around agricultural fields. And this backs up some of our data showing that coyotes really don't like forested areas. They prefer these open agricultural areas or these early successional habitats. Um, we released 60% of all these animals. So six out of 10 coyotes went back out as sterile placeholders. The other 40% were euthanized. Most of that happened early on in the program. Once they got better control of sterilization, had a better feel for how to manage coyotes. Most coyotes at that point went back out on the landscape as a placeholder. Um, and so by 2013, the, the coyote to red wolf ratio was two to one, but we still had very low introgression in the population. And the leading cause of deaths for coyotes out there wasn't the general public. It was actually the fish and wildlife biologists. 60% um, of the radio collared animals were, were uh, removed by the recovery program biologists to create space for wolves. And when they did that, it was good timing. Um, and that allowed wolves to move into certain areas and reoccupy that space. They just weren't randomly being shot by people. And most of the deaths of coyotes, um, like I said, were, was attributed to wolf management. Very few of it was due to like accidental um, uh, killing, you know, by, by cars, like automobile accidents or anything like that, or, or, or shooting by hunters or whatnot. 
And so the coyote density out there with a the combination of non-lethal sterilization, some lethal control, and the presence of wolves uh, excluding coyotes from areas, we had a, a, a pretty low coyote density. It was about 0.04 coyotes per square kilometer. So that works to be about 40 coyotes per thousand square, or per thousand square kilometers. Um, the only areas that you would see that kind of low density would be in their northern latitudes, like up in Alaska, the Yukon, very far north in the northeast um, towards like in, into Canada. Um, that's very, you know, when you go outside the recovery area, you would find considerably larger uh, or greater densities of coyotes. So, like I said, the management out there worked really effectively at keeping coyote numbers down. Um, but there's some conflict in data. Um, with with harvest um, that can confuse and creates issues with with the idea of um, I guess what the coyote population is actually so in the state the, these uh, state agencies commonly collect uh, harvest data by surveying hunters and there's data out there suggesting that there's been over 600 or 200 or 500 coyotes killed in the recovery area from like each year from like 2010 up to 2016. The issue is, is this, the, the, the number of respondents are quite low. So like in 2010, you have like eight guys claiming they killed 630 coyotes. Um, in 2016, it's nine guys claiming they killed close to 200. And that's just not possible given what the Fish and Wildlife Service has been doing out there for the past 30 years. And, um, and so this, this creates, again, conflicting data um, the data you should probably trust is what came out of the recovery program. It's just not possible to have that kind of kill rate uh, in the background. And so, um, so that's uh, how, if you did have that, how could they maintain like uh, widespread management of coyotes out there? One is, is, is through public relations. And so the Fish and Wildlife Service had this responsive management plan down a couple of years ago. Um, and, and most of the residents, about 70% said that coyotes don't cause problems. Um, and only about 16% said they would shoot or kill coyotes on their property, and most wouldn't take any, any action against them. And so only 11% claim to have done that. And that kind of matches up with the, the field data showing that most coyotes aren't actually killed by the public, that most coyotes in the recovery area are actually um, um, killed lethally by, by your resource agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service in response to the needs of the wolf population. And so I think that shows um, how effective uh, the recovery program is, is in managing coyotes out here. Using this non-lethal approach of sterilization, it also gave us an opportunity to sort of uh, monitor and watch how coyotes move in and interact with the wolf population and as animals died, how they replaced the dead on the landscape. Um, in this case, uh, when we had coyotes move in in the early 2000s, they sort of just cycle through bounced around, they couldn't really find space, and then they left the recovery area. Um, as time went on and, and, and wolves were getting shot and some space was being acquired by the coyotes, we realized that coyotes that were sterilized weren't um, leaving their territories and occupying uh, new vacancies. So once they grabbed some turf, they stayed there, they really didn't move. It was this new transient population that kept cycling through. And so we knew most of the animals were coming into the area, into the peninsula from outside. And we just didn't know how far away that was happening. So the best way to figure that out was to look at uh, coyotes that left the recovery area. And we published this paper some time ago, looking at transients moving out of, out of, uh, out of uh, the peninsula. And we saw them move as far as, as Raleigh up north and Chowan up here and down in uh, Greenville. And we realized that, um, that they could come from far away, that they had some really long distance dispersal capabilities. And in the process of these animals moving, we realized they would stop and hang out in an area for several weeks and then leave and move on and then stop, hang out and move on. And we, we realized that um, we really didn't know much about transient movements, not as well as we did about resident animals. And that these, these pit stops they were making may not have been for foraging efforts. It may not have been that they were exhausted energetically and they had to stop and eat and, and bulk up and, and make another long distance movements, but instead they might've been stopping and assessing areas and getting a feel for the area and deciding whether or not they would wanna set up residency there. And so at that time, we didn't really know what to call these areas. So we, we dubbed them biting areas. And interestingly, this kind of picked up and other, other research looked into it. Um, here in this case is another paper we published uh, this, this here was in this hatch mark that I'm circling was a resident male coyote with a female. The Kilkenny pack uh, 
uh, killed the female coyote and pushed him out. These dots here represent his movements around this area um, as a transient. Um, he was stopping here for a few weeks, would come down here, go up here, come back. And eventually he wound up pairing up with that, that female wolf that I showed you before uh, that paired up here. He was the coyote that paired up with her that we had to later remove. So he wasn't a young dispersing animal. He was actually an older an adult male that was displaced. So your transient population is not just young dispersing animals, it's also these older displaced animals. In this case down here, we had a wolf pack um, get, get shot up um, and displaced. Uh, this animal was a transient, just sort of biding around here, eventually moved in here and became a, a breeder um, and established a territory there. So a lot of times, we, this is what we were seeing was that these transient animals would wind up just biding around and then when something opened up, they jumped in there and, and took advantage of it. Other folks were seeing that elsewhere. This is, um, this is a study done out in Western Virginia, um, not West Virginia, but the Western area of Virginia by Virginia Tech. Dana Moran doing her PhD work. She was similar, she was seeing similar issues with transients, just sort of biding around, um, waiting for an opportunity to move into a vacancy. And they suggested like we did that this was an important life history strategy that we had been missing in the past. So that coyotes weren't essentially um, responding to mortality through uh, compensatory breeding, it was actually compensatory immigration. So when somebody goes out in the property and they shoot a couple coyotes, and they turn around and say, well, I removed one, it feels like four or five more showed up. Um, that is the case. Um, usually they're removing an individual um, and so these transients realize there's an opening, they, they collapse in and, and try to, to occupy that space. Uh, so that became the big research question that some agencies want to know, and we were able to, to go out of state, out of the recovery area and look at elsewhere. So we had to set up the situation where we uh, launched almost 200 GPS collars on coyotes in Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina to replicate what we saw in North Carolina. And that was to just basically look at the differences between these resident animals and these transient animals to see what was going on. Um, we want to know basically when a resident became a transient, basically when animals dispersed from their natal territories or when a resident animal lost its territory due to some event. Um, when they became a transient, they really had two options. They had to go back out and um, move extensively looking for an opportunity to grab a territory. And if they didn't, they would have died trying. So there's two outcomes. They either become a breeder or they wind up dying. And so that was kind of important with us trying to figure out how these animals were sort of persisting and, and maintaining populations in response to these types of pressures that they would see on the landscape. And um, basically quantify their space use, look at habitats that they, they were using that may have lower mortality risk for them. And then once they do establish territories, what they're using within those territories. Um, so this stuff can be pretty messy just to show you how this might work. This is three animals in a, in a, in a, in a coyote territory in uh, Georgia. So the small dots, the small red and, and yellow dots represent the male and female breeder. The big blue dots are their juvenile offspring from, from that, that year before. Um, you can see the territory there that the juvenile uses it just like the adults do. And it did that for about four or five months when we had the collar on it. It showed very cohesive movements with the adults and did everything with them. But at some point, it wound up shifting its use of the territory to the edge and began making these excursive movements outside and exploring. And those we, su we suggest are like predispersal um, movements. So it's sort of taking a, taking a look at the landscape and uh, getting a better feel for it before it steps off. Um, and then it does. And finally it, it left its territory and sort of this big looping circular moving around Augusta and then came back in and wound up getting hit and killed on, on 520 here, uh, the uh, uh, highway. And so those, those kind of animals can be problematic because they're not truly residents, but they're not transient. And so that data can be a bit tricky. And so when you catch animals, you catch them in the process of doing that. So in this red, these red dots represent one coyote that's a transient. Yellow, again, another transient animal. You can see they're just sort of bouncing around. Um, and eventually they just sort of stick. You know, in this case, this yellow animal wound up establishing a territory here where it's, uh, you have those purple dots and the blue dots represent this animal in red. Uh, establishing a territory there. And that's kind of interesting. Like these are settlements. These are, these are situations where coyotes are finding a way to establish a territory with a mate and we don't know what they're looking for. And so some of the research is trying to figure out just that, what, what's triggering that behavior. Um, and so going back to North Carolina, looking at this, getting a better idea about the movements, 
on the left here, you see all this um, blue. Those are areas that coyotes aren't really using. Um, these areas in red and yellow are where they're establishing territories. And that's where their breeding territories are and where they're <clears throat> reproducing and likely having the biggest effect on like deer numbers or rat, uh, cottontails or whatever they're eating. Uh, to the right um, in, ye in yellow and red are, are movements of transients. And you can see that they're very correlated with roads and linear structure because that's what they, these coyotes are doing. Um, they can't use the wooded areas just because they're not usable, they're just too wet and too thick for them to um, hammer out some, some use and they can't use territories. So they're sort of forced in these interstitches between unsuitable habitat and territories and they just sort of bounce around in these road networks. Like I said, it's like a game of musical chairs as they move around, they're waiting for something to die. And in that case, they're gonna fill in. Um, when we looked at um, you know, the three states in the Tri-State Project, uh, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina, um, we found similar movement patterns too. Um, there weren't, uh, you know, everything in red here is, is really good breeding habitat for coyotes. In yellow is moderate habitat, but what's in blue is, is probably poor quality habitat. Um, and then over here where the transients are, we see a sort of similar pattern, but most of it's these linear movements along these power lines and roads and whatnot. So we're seeing a similar effect of uh, space use with coyotes outside the recovery area. Um, they're not ubiquitous as far as breeding territories go, but there are areas where coyotes have a hard time establishing territories or persisting. And that, that, that large blue area is the signature here. I'm not sure exactly why that's the case. It's, it's mostly forested area that they don't like. We had some animals out here. Uh, we had other animals down here around this area. And just for whatever reason, um, this is a low population or a low density area for coyotes. Uh, we're, we're in the process of figuring that out. But what's interesting about that area is that, um, you know, like I said, this southern uh, route into the southeast, the animals mostly moved along the coastal bottom line areas up into the uh, mid-Atlantic. They never really pushed across the Appalachian Mountains. They kind of hit that and wound up doing this pincer movement. And I think that's kind of reflective of that habitat there where it forced them to move their, their movements down the agricultural areas of the coastal bottom lines. And then, like I said, it has to do with habitat. Coyotes like open habitat so they can pursue prey. Um, down here, these are actually photos of two wolves, but they use similar habitat types. Uh, and agricultural fields, there's not a whole lot of understory with them, especially with row crops. Um, but, you know, some of these, these forested areas can have really dense um, understory. It's essentially like a vegetative wall that prevents movement. And so coyotes are essentially pushed out of these areas just by, you know, vegetation growth. And so those are habitats they're not going to use, which is why they don't heavily rely on, on, agri or on forested habitats in the southeast. Um, and instead, they, they prefer these um, timberlands where you have, um, you know, these, these early successional habitats or you have areas that are, the, the understory is, is not, um, not as well developed. Um, and so, yeah, and so you look inside their territories. Here you can see this is the core area where all their locations are. We spend most of their time, which is usually correlated with their agricultural areas. So even though in their forested habitats, they rely heavily on these open spaces um, to establish uh, their territories in, um, their home ranges, and then they'll utilize the forested areas for cover during the day, usually on the edges. And then at night they come out and they, they pretty much work these fields. And so in those areas, we go in and collect scat to get at their diet. What you see in red is, is red wolf diet. You can see red wolves rely mostly on deer and rabbits and small mammals. In North Carolina, you see a big drop off. You still see quite a bit of consumption by deer, both by coyotes in North Carolina in the tri-state area. But what's interesting is um, in the tri-state area, we see less reliance on rabbit and small mammals than you do in North Carolina and more reliance on, on fruit and vegetation. It's like, like I mentioned before, like you see a lot of variation on the landscape and it's important to have these large scale studies to see if there are true regional differences. Um, in this case, I do think there is, um, mostly because the agricultural areas um, may have less vegetation. And so in that situation, you may see less consumption of uh, like fruit, like persimmon and blackberry, and they may shift to more uh, mammalian prey in this case. Uh, rabbit and small mammals, but as far as deer go, there's no difference between four states. Uh, coyotes are routinely hitting deer wherever they are. Um, so we, we were able to look at some issues with that, with deer consumption, and we looked at like the habitat composition within their territories where we collect the scat from. We found that like, you know, coyotes that maintain very small home ranges were more likely to be consuming deer than coyotes that maintain large home ranges. And we saw that vegetation density had an effect too. 
So basically coyotes that maintain small home ranges but had some open habitats uh, were more efficient deer predators. Uh, coyotes that maintain large habitats um, that had um, some, some, some openings were more likely to be consuming rabbits. And so we suspected that um, the reliance on deer would, would effectively um, mean that they didn't have to search large areas for these animals and they could essentially establish a small territory. Um, but if they were relying on smaller prey, they would have to uh, forage in more broadly across the landscape to find more rabbits to, to meet energetic demands, which is why they had um, larger home ranges. And at some point, if the habitat quality is so low that they have to maintain the very large home ranges, um, energetically, it's not feasible to do that. And they'll abandon those areas after time and go somewhere else that's more productive. Um, and so it's pretty interesting. Again, looking at uh, broadly across those three states, we found that deer consumption was pretty much similar throughout the year, month to month. Um, they were consuming the same amount of deer. The only difference you see is in the summer when they drop fawns, um, you see a pickup of uh, fawn consumption, and then, and then eventually fawns are aging into um, like adult sized bodies. Um, and at that point, we can't detect whether or not they're consuming younger animals, but they're definitely eating deer uh, throughout the year. Um, this, this sort of contradicts a lot of um, previous studies that suggested that uh, coyotes were eating fawns during the spring and summer, but then shifting to scavenging uh, deer during the winter. But um, we're not seeing any indication of that, uh, mostly because of the, the corresponding data that we collected suggested that they were hunting them. Um, one other thing that we found um, in North Carolina was that uh, as uh, the breeder body mass of wolves increased, we saw that they were more reliant on deer. So the bigger the animals are, the more likely they had to consume um, deer more often. They had to rely more heavily on them as, as, as their primary prey. Uh, we saw that same trend with coyotes too um, in North Carolina. We didn't do this in the other project, but this suggests that coyotes are not scavenging either, that as they get bigger, they're more capable of, of going out and being more effective hunters of, of, of white-tailed deer and consuming them. Um, being in the same landscape with red wolves, uh, if coyotes were taking advantage of um, hunter killed uh, carcasses, you would have to assume red wolves would, were too. And that wasn't the case. And at times we had coyotes pair bonding with wolves and acquiring more deer in their diet, suggesting that coyotes were able to uh, coordinate with wolves as, as, a, as a mate and, and effectively hunt deer with them too. So we were seeing that these animals were actually preying on adult deer out there. And we're assuming that's happening elsewhere. Uh, and finally, sort of to close up, I know I'm kind of taking a little while with this, uh, the final thing here is, is survival, looking at what's killing coyotes across the landscape. And what we find um, throughout the southeast is most of that's related to um, gunshot mortalities. Uh, and then this trend was the same for residents and transients. But transient animals tended to have lower survival than residents did. But survival altogether is pretty good, um, but they're not dying naturally. Overwhelmingly, they're dying at the hands of people. Um, in North Carolina, we looked at red wolves and we found this unique trend where survival decreases uh, quite a bit during the winter and fall and that's tied to the deer hunting season. October 15th is when deer hunting season starts and so wolves are getting shot and monthly survivals drop here and then they pick back up when the deer hunting season ends in late December. Uh, we see another little drop with uh, wolf survival in May and April and that's cor that, that, that correlates or is, is at the same time of the year when you have um, spring gobbler season, so turkey hunters. So we see some gunshot mortalities there. Looking at coyote survival month to month throughout the southeast, we're seeing similar trends too. You see this, that drop here in November and December, and you see that unique dip in May. So we know that in North Carolina and outside into the other parts of the southeast, there's similar mortality trends for coyotes. Um, and what's interesting is when you go out and recover these carcasses, our next step here is to tie the habitat characteristics in with their deaths. So if we know what the animal died of, in this case, this wolf, this coyote was shot, uh, recovered here, I could measure different uh, distances to say like a power line or to a road. In this case here, this is a food plot uh, used for, for hunting. So there's a hunting tower here. So this coyote eventually showed his face and got shot and ran up here and died and I recovered it. So we can assess that area and look at that at, at risk that, uh, for, for these animals. Um, if we can look at mortality risks, we can then look at how coyotes are responding to the landscape and where they're setting up their territories and, uh, and breeding and how they're avoiding being harvested by humans and, uh, and essentially surviving on the landscape. Um, and so moving out of this, 
next big project just to close up here is in um, this this area of the Gulf Coast where Red Wolves once existed. Uh, just previous, uh, just recently, two two independent researchers um, projects found red wolf ancestry in eastern Texas and southwestern Louisiana. And there was recently the the National Academy of Sciences uh, put out a, a a public notice asking for proposals to uh, for researchers to go in there and and look at and survey the population to. Um, to, uh, to, to assess for red wolf ancestry. Uh, so that's kind of the big new thing for uh, coyote research, I guess, here in the Eastern US is, is to go down here and, and look at that stuff. But for red wolf recovery, because the Wolf Conservation Center is, is sort of hosting this talk, I just want to close on that. Um, with, with the coyote work that I did in North Carolina, when you first get in, when I first got out there as a PhD student, I thought they were going to be a problem. Um, and it turned out they weren't as terrible as I thought they were going to be and that they were actually more helpful as a surrogate species for red wolf recovery. Um, the issue that we have with hybridization is largely a result of anthropogenic mortality, you know, with people killing wolves and coyotes moving in and then the wolves pairing up with them because they don't have anything else to, to breed with. Um, it's not really the coyotes fault. They're essentially doing what they're supposed to do as a, as a species in responding to this loss of a, a larger canid species on the landscape. Um, but because they're able to pair up with wolves and because they use similar prey and habitat, um, coyotes are essentially what I said, a surrogate species. And since we don't have other wolf populations elsewhere in the southeast, but there is a goal of establishing new wolf populations in other areas of the historic range, um, we need to study those areas, figure out what the wolf population might do there. Um, is it a good area to put a new population or is it an environment where wolves will likely not survive? The best way to do that is to go in those areas and study coyotes. As I showed you with the mortality, uh, perhaps just a couple slides ago, um, if coyotes are largely dying at the hands of people, if you were to put wolves there, they would die at the hands of people. Um, when coyotes die, again, if they're dying during the hunting season, we can tell that those wolves would then be themselves killed during that time. Um, and the most important aspect of studying coyotes is looking at how they respond to that mortality, how they respond to the anthropogenic landscape and do it well there. And then, and once we know effectively how they're doing it, then we can try to see how wolves would respond in the same way. And if we know how wolves are failing and it doesn't line up with how coyotes are surviving, we then can establish, I guess, management to mitigate those causes. Um, the big thing we see in North Carolina is this transient portion of the population. There's just enough transients of coyote, there's enough transients on the landscapes for coyote populations to sustain themselves. Because when coyotes die, uh, these new transients move in, they occupy those vacancies. We don't have enough wolves on the landscape to do that. So when we have 100 wolves in North Carolina and 20 of them wind up dying that year, we don't have a transient population of wolves to collapse in on that population or those, those vacancies to reestablish breeding pairs um, to then start reproducing and, and, um, and um, um, recovering, you know what I mean? And so in this case, that's what our, 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 uh, our suggestions are for wolf management is basically to try to find a way to mimic what coyotes are doing and increase wolf populations enough that wolves saturate an area and then you have this transient portion of the population. So when wolves die, wolves collapse in on those areas and reclaim them as opposed to having coyotes do it. And I know I've taken quite a bit of time here with this talk, so I'm going to end it with some questions. So sorry about that, Maggie. I took a long time. But. <laughs> no problem, Joey. Thank you so much. Um, we'll go ahead and take some questions. Uh, um, but for those of you who just joined um, or joined during the program, uh, we're here with Joey Hinton. And he just finished his talk on taxonomy, ecology, and management of coyotes in the eastern United States. Uh, just a reminder for those with questions, please be sure to type them into the Q&A box in your control panel. And uh, let's see, I'll start with this one. Um, why, can, why can't coyotes be relocated within their range of radius 10 to 15 miles or more? So I guess this is uh, from earlier in your presentation, Joey, and we were talking about how uh, maybe it was in the uh, suburban or urban areas, why, why the animals cannot be relocated. Right, um, so they, they tend to have a, uh, they, they have a tendency to come back to their natal areas. So if you were to capture a breeder um, in an area like around a school zone and uh, were to go 20 miles away and drop it off, 
it would come back and to the spot and try to reclaim its territory. Um, we know that I've done that before because I've run trap lines and I've gotten animals up and to avoid having an animal on my line, I would take it 20 miles down the road and release it. And so it would be off my line for a day or two and then come back and that give me an opportunity to get the other animal up that I wanted. And so that's the problem. Um, they, they just come back. And if it's a problem animal that is threatening your pets, it's aggressive, you're not going to want to relocate that animal anyway. Um, so yeah, relocation doesn't really work that well. And so that's where some of the non-lethal approaches come in. If you can just tolerate the coyote's presence there, uh, use hazing techniques or hazing methods um, of keeping them away from your house or your school zone or whatever it is that you're concerned about. Um, over time, those animals will adjust to that and they just may avoid it. So if you go in and, and, and wind up killing that animal, a new one will come in um, with different behaviors and you're constantly managing new animals. Sometimes it's better just to, just to manage the ones that you have there. Um, and we, and that, you know, that, that kind of hazing is effective. We had issues with some wolves um, digging up hoses um, around people's houses or getting in the backyards and taking kids' toys. Same with some coyotes. And we would just go in there, trap them, hold them for a day or two, and then put them back out. And because that was such a terrible experience, they tended to avoid those areas. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's kind of a long one in response. But um, they always come back, and that's why you can't relocate them. Thank you. Uh, and this question um, kind of comes in the tails of the other one. Uh, says you mentioned earlier that more recent non-lethal management approaches are becoming more effective than lethal approach, <clears throat> excuse me, but also they can't really trans uh, transplant coyotes effectively, which you just stressed. Uh, can you expand on what some of these new approaches are? Okay, um, yeah, this, this is an area that I'm not super familiar with because I don't work with hazing and managing uh, nuisance wildlife, but um, the big one is the sterilization approach in North Carolina. Um, the Red Wolf Recovery Program didn't invent that. Uh, basically, that's research that's been done out of Utah State University with their USDA uh, research facility out there. Uh, Fred Knowlton and Eric Giese and uh, Julie Young and some other researchers out there have been um, experimenting with that methodology. The idea is that um, if you have breeding coyotes in an area because they have offspring, they may focus on taking sheep or livestock to bring those bigger prey items back to their pups. If you remove their pups, then they don't have to rely on large prey. They can then focus on smaller natural prey like small mammals and hares. Um, so the idea is that you don't kill the coyotes, that you just go in and you sterilize them. As long as they don't have pups, you may influence their dietary preferences. And they've tested this with pronghorns and they've seen that there's been fewer predation events on pronghorns in territories that you have sterile coyotes versus areas where you have reproductively active ones. Um, and that seems to be like, that's the kind of new approach that some, some folks are interested in. We've had success in North Carolina for other reasons as far as managing for the wolf population. But when we came out with our research and began communicating with other researchers and, and wildlife agencies, there's a general uh, interest in, in, in understanding that, that technique and, and seeing if it's applicable or can be applied on the landscape. Um, one interest was like um, in areas on, in coastal areas, on barrier islands where you have nesting areas where coyotes might be uh, the primary nest predator. Um, is it better to remove them or could you sterilize them and then manage their, their diets by uh, eliminating their ability or their need to feed offspring. That's one area would be um, interesting. Uh, but in general, it, it would be a difficult technique to apply in private lands um, elsewhere because you have to worry about your neighbor. If you spend money to manage a, coyote, a sterile coyote population, um, if you have high exploitation, um, having these animals killed and then replaced with reproductive animals is not is not feasible. So it would it would require some regulation of coyote take um, in that in that in that situation. Um, outside that, I know there's a large um, project going on to monitor boldness in coyotes to see if there's a if there is a difference in urban populations versus rural populations. The assumption is that coyotes that live in close quarters with humans in urban areas might be more bold. Um, and so there's some interest in learning about that boldness, those specific behaviors, and then finding ways, I guess, to uh, haze them in a way that makes them risk averse and, and direct their behavior, I guess, some other way. I'm not sure, but like I said, that, that's an area that I'm not too familiar with. So hopefully this, this long-winded answer sort of addressed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Joey. 
Um, there are a number of questions here um, uh, that are asking uh, about uh, the futility of hunting coyotes. Uh -huh. um, and how it uh, impacts the social hierarchy of those uh, coyote families, and also uh, potential growth of that coyote population. Okay. Um, could you? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, um, with hunting, um, coyotes are pretty resilient to it. Uh, I mean, we can. In some areas of the U.S., I mean, it, it's an outright just whatever you want to do to take a coyote, you can take them. I mean, there's you can shoot them, you can trap them. In some areas, you can poison them. In the upper Midwest, I think you can actually run them over snowmobiles. I mean, it's like it's it's what we do is at times overly ridiculous, and they do a good job of being resilient to that. And so that's why there's this focus on this more this more small scale management of them. And in the Southeast, there's this effort to uh, be more, I guess, conservative with the take of coyotes um, with landowners. They're not going to waste uh, time and money trying to, uh, I guess, uh, over harvest coyotes throughout the year. Um, and so they may focus trapping efforts right before the fawning season. Because their main objective in this case, if they're managing their properties for hunting and leasing their properties to make some income off of it, they want to have a lot of deer on their property for the hunters to have success because they want those hunters to come back the following year and, and pay off those leases or whatever. And so they may just come in and in February or March or something like that, just have a trapper come in there and whack the coyote population back in hopes that um, by the time the fawns are being dropped, um, there's no coyote predation on those fawns. And after about two or three weeks, the fawns are large enough that they can run into cover and avoid predation. And then those fawns eventually age into adult bucks that are, can be harvested the following year. So that seems to be the new management thing now is timing your take of coyotes. Rather than being concerned about broad scale um, removal efforts, it's more or less on the landowners now to just go ahead and, and uh, implement strategies that way. Um, and that seems to be the, um, the approach now. Um, the other, the other thing is just habitat management. If you don't want to do that, you can just manage for, for, uh, for fawn cover or something like that. But, um, hunting, I think it's just exhausted now. Um, there's not much we can, there's not many other opportunities that we can give people to kill these things. Um, and so, um, I hope I answered that question, but that's kind of the direction we're at now. It's a matter of timing for effect as opposed to removal, um, for absence. If that makes sense. Okay, let me look. <clears throat> um, this one is, do you know, uh, Joey, are you familiar with um, some of the things happening in Massachusetts? Um, Coyote it, related? It, what's that, excuse me? Um, in Massachusetts, the question is, it says, uh, in hearings in Massachusetts to stop coyote killing contests, Oh. Uh, department speakers allege that coyotes killed mostly fawns. Oh, this is that related. Um, from your research, that looks to be erroneous. No, they do. They do. Um, my research shows that they do eat a lot of fawns. They eat, they eat a lot of deer. Um, at 30 to 40 percent of their diet, at least down here in the southeast, is is deer. Um, as you get up north, it, it gets a little problematic. We see differences in in the studies that can be uh, that contradict what we're seeing in the southeast. Um, but in the Northeast, I would suspect they are hitting fawns. Some of the consumption of deer in the winter could be related to uh, loss of, of adults during winter, you know, severe weather and stuff like that, where they might be getting on the carcasses. Um, but if, if the resource agencies are, are saying that the coyotes are hitting fawns, they're, they're not, that's not erroneous or it's not a mistake, they are. The issue is, is whether or not the deer population is itself resilient to that predation. In my opinion, it is. I mean. Uh, white-tailed deer are going to produce a lot more offspring that can survive and what the coyotes are eating are essentially, you know, uh, fawns that probably wouldn't survive that, that summer or that, that, that winter themselves. Um, so, in my opinion, uh, you know, predation is fine. I don't think it's having a negative effect on populations, broad scale. Okay, let's just do one last question. Um, Joey, this one's asking, um, I've heard hunters say they know when coyotes have taken down a deer because the coyotes start yipping like crazy. 
I'm very skeptical of that. I've always assumed the yipping was the few individuals coming together or communicating. Do you know what these yips mean? They often occur after intro howls. Yeah, I, I suspect it's, um, depending on the time of the year, um, I suspect it's just pack members communicating. Uh, I don't think it's, um, it's all that correlated with hunting. I mean, I've, I've been in the field quite a bit with these animals and most of the time you don't hear them. Um, uh, it's, it's rare that you actually do catch yourself uh, hearing them howl or yip or communicate with each other. And based on my tracking and being <clears throat> around them when they do that, I don't think it's correlated with hunting. Um, I mean, I don't know how the hunters would know that themselves, uh, whether or not how they correlate that with their behaviors. I just suspect, like I said, uh, they're just out and about and something gets their attention and they just start communicating with each other. It's probably for multiple reasons that we probably don't know um, at the moment when it's going on, but no, I don't think it's correlated with that. Interesting. Well, Joey, um, I just want to thank you again uh, for taking the time and giving us this really robust um, presentation. I mean, just from from the evolution and some of the uh, really the history of, of where they move uh, throughout North America and also now the way they're treated um, and managed uh, in our states. Um, you know, it's tough being a wild animal, but it's probably really tough being a coyote <laughs> so yeah. i must say my hat's off to them but um if any of you uh have any other questions um uh joey will soon have a website and you can see more of his research there uh so stay tuned uh but in the meantime we really appreciate everyone being here um and joining us tonight uh joey is there anything else you want to say before we wrap up no, I just, I appreciate it. I know it took a while. I thought I was going to get that in in 45 minutes. It wound up being like an hour and 20. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about that. But yeah, it's a lot of material. So hopefully I didn't bore anyone to death with it. So hopefully. No, Joey. Okay. Again, thank you. And no it's definitely an interesting topic. Coyotes are, are definitely something that people like talking about a lot. Um, and for everyone else, uh, this will be posted on our website and within a day or two. So if you missed any or want to review anything, please feel free to visit. Uh, thanks again. Thanks, Joey. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Yep. Good night. Easy. Good night.